So now it gives me a, a great pleasure to introduce our guest uh, speaker for the evening, who's been with the Joy Course for many years now, um, five, six years, um, and somebody who I make sure is on the lineup because there's so much um, wisdom and clarity and uh, depth and, uh, and interest as well. Uh, and that's um, my good friend, uh, Rick Hansen, who is a neuropsychologist, therapist, uh, neuroscience expert, author of Buddha's Brain and Just One Thing, and uh, very pragmatic ways of understanding how we're wired up uh, and uh, fun at the same time. So please welcome Rick Hansen. Well, I'm very pleased to be here, really pleased. And uh, I consider it such a privilege to be able to participate in what James has created here. I was saying to someone before we began that it's really quite extraordinary what he's done. I mean, literally well over 10,000 people at this point could well be tens of thousands of people worldwide, known and unknown. Uh, have taken this course, and it's so generously offered, it's so packed with content. You really have been a source of this, and it's seeded so many ripples from it. So I consider it completely an honor to be able to be here. Uh, in terms of uh, what I'd like to talk with you about, in roughly half an hour, I'd like to present, first of all, a kind of roadmap for who we are and what to do about it. Um, I want to... <laughs> ground this uh, really cool stuff about loving yourself and all the rest of that uh, in the body, in the animal body, uh, what um, you know, Mary Oliver has called the soft animal of the body. So that's the first part, little framework. I'm going to move through that fairly briskly. And then based on that, offer two ways to actually practice and embody loving oneself. And then hopefully have a few minutes at least at the end for some questions and discussion. All right. So Get ready, strap on the seatbelt. I will be moving quickly through the first portion here. So a little evolution, right? Um, basically, as you probably know, the brain evolved like the three floors of a house stacked on top of each other. We have brain stem, subcortex, cortex, loosely associated with reptile, mammalian, and primate human stages of evolution, loosely. Also, relatively loosely, we have three fundamental needs that were addressed by the evolving brain. And somewhat in order, our fundamental need for safety, fundamental need for satisfaction, for getting rewards, and our fundamental need for connection, relationships. So we have the threat system, the reward system, and the social system. Okay, so far? Okay, three things. Right. Loosely associated, now today the whole brain works together to meet those needs. But the ways in which the brain goes about meeting those needs are very shaped by the parts of the brain that particularly focus on meeting those needs. Now, what happens when we experience that our core needs are met? Well, in terms of our core need for safety, which is managed by the avoiding harms system in the brain, kind of an operating system, if we experience that our needs for safety are met, we default to a basic state of calm or peace. If we experience that our basic needs for satisfaction, for rewards are met, we're getting enough carrots, right? We default to a basic sense of contentment in a single umbrella word. And if we experience that our basic needs for connection, for love, for inclusion are met in terms of our attaching system, attaching to others system, we default to a basic sense of love in which we feel both loved and loving since love is love remarkably, whether it's flowing in or flowing out. That's pretty good news, right? And in that condition, the body repairs and refuels itself and um, can function in an ongoing homeostatic way. It's an equilibrium condition. It's a sustainable condition. I think of it as the green zone, the green setting of the brain. All right? Good news. On the other hand, what happens if we feel overchallenged? And we're not able to experience being fundamentally safe, even if we're dealing with challenges or threats or danger. We are not able to feel fundamentally um, satisfied if we're dealing with losses or uh, opportunities just out of reach. And we're not able, let's say, to feel fundamentally loved uh, 
even as we grapple with issues in the relationship field. Then the brain has a second setting. It moves out of the green zone, which I call the responsive mode of the brain, and it tips into the fight or flight red zone, the reactive mode of the brain, two settings of the brain. And in that state, in terms of the avoiding harm system, we tip into a state of fear, all right? Flight. We want to withdraw from what's unpleasant or resist it. Or in terms of the reward-seeking part of the brain, the carrot-seeking part of the brain, we tip into a state of frustration, drivenness, and grasping, if you will. And in terms of the attaching to others system of the brain, uh, when we experience that those basic needs for connection are not met, we tip into a state of envy or shame or loneliness or, in a word, heartache. <clears throat> this is the brain in the red zone. The body kicks into gear. The stress hormones flood through us, including moving back up into the brain. And we uh, run from the lion or we chase the opportunity or we struggle with or cling to others. All right? Bodily resources are burned faster than we can take them in. Long-term projects are put on hold. And the mind, in three basic words, is colored by a state of fear, frustration, and heartache in terms of those three core systems and core needs. That's a brain that's colored strongly by qualities of resisting in terms of the avoiding system, qualities of grasping in terms of the uh, approach and reward system, and a quality of clinging in terms of the attaching to other system or in a single encompassing word, a brain colored by craving and therefore suffering. So for those of you who are tracking what I'm doing, I'm trying to naturalize the Dharma. In other words, I'm trying to ground this ancient Buddhist psychology that's profoundly penetrating in its analysis of human psychology without reference in the frame that I'm working in to anything supernatural or metaphysical uh, or transcendental. In that frame, the Buddha's analysis, of course, as you know, is that forms of craving lead to suffering. I'm asking myself, you know, we understand the causes, the mental causes of suffering in their end. What are the underlying biological, evolutionary, neural causes of the mental causes of suffering in its end? So in this state in which we've moved into the red zone, this fight or flight reactive zone, Mother Nature's plan for us is that we spike, if you will, in terms of the red zone, the reactive mode, but we get out of the red zone quickly because in the wild, as our ancestors evolved, most stressful episodes end quickly, one way or another, <laughs> right? And the zebra, one zebra gets nailed, the rest of the zebra herd is fine, and they go back to eating grass, kind of looking <laughs> over their shoulder, right? That's the natural template. Brief bursts of red, hopefully ending well, with a long recovery in green, right? That's Mother Nature's plan. And if it goes like that, it's probably okay to have these red bursts, if you will, long green. But is that our modern life for most of us today? No. We may not have the spikes of running in terror for our lives, hopefully, not on a daily basis of back in the Serengeti. But on the other hand, we experience chronic mild to moderate stress with no opportunity to recover. So we have spike, partial down spike, partial down spike, partial down. And then if we recover, we do things like overeat, drugs and alcohol, way too much television, you know. Next thing you know, then you're stressed out again, on and on and on it goes, right? Or we crank ourselves up with coffee in the morning to kind of get back on the daily battlefield, right? What to do about it? Well, the problem is we're vulnerable to the red zone in three fundamental ways just built into the brain. Three aspects of its negativity bias is what scientists call it. In the first place, we're rapidly moved out of the green zone, the responsive mode of the brain, because survival threats or opportunities have a lot of urgency and a lot of impact. If we don't deal with them immediately, we're going to be in trouble. Second, even if we feel relatively mellow, kind of in the green zone, you know, the inner internal dashboard is green, green, green in terms of our three needs. Still, have you ever noticed how hard it is not to feel any anxiety whatsoever? Right? Mother Nature wants us to be always a little anxious, even if we're just kind of eating the grass and it's all mellow. She wants us to be a little uneasy, correct? Uh, same time, she wants our brain to be constantly scanning for the next thing to want, one more thing to want. 
Yeah? My precious, right? <laughs> and then she also wants us to be looking around, you know? Like if we have any mates or partners, like who are you flirting with? Okay? Or, you know, how much do you love me today? I knew you loved me yesterday, but do you love me today too? You know, we're looking for that, right? So I was a little edgy, always a little uneasy. It's hard to feel profoundly peaceful, profoundly contented, or profoundly loved and loving. Second vulnerability. The third aspect of the re negativity bias is that the brain overlearns from pain. In other words, it overlearns from negative, reactive, red zone experiences, never forget. Once burned, twice shy. Or as I put it, the brain is like Velcro for negative experiences, but Teflon for positive ones. The brain is very good by evolutionary design to learn from, it's very good at learning from the bad, and it's very bad at learning from the good. Right? And so you can see then the consequences. We start to accumulate what's called allostatic load, because it's not, the red zone is not really designed to be sustainable. It's designed to be a very quick burst that's not a long-term plan. So if we make it routine, as we do in modern life, with mild to moderate chronic stress, with very little periods of fully green recovery between these spikes, right, we start to accumulate wear and tear in our body in terms of the immune system, digestion, hormones, and so forth. We start depleting neurotransmitters like serotonin, so we're vulnerable increasingly to stress, uh, to depression. Um, and mentally, our mind is continually colored by this fundamental background sense of fear and anger in terms of the threat system, background sense of frustration, disappointment, and drivenness in terms of the approaching reward system, and an ongoing background sense of loneliness, disconnection, you know, kind of covered over, hole in the heart, right? And then, because we experience this way, we, lit, we feel this way, we start acting in various ways to other people, toward other people that create vicious cycles, and then you can see this issue of the red brain, as it were, writ large globally. So if you have groups or nations uh, or religions or what have you that feel threatened, well, they're gonna, you know, that will cause the reactive mode of their brain to just go into high gear. If they feel frustrated or desperate or greedy, then they start gorging on the planet's scarce resources in this kind of frenzy of appetite. Or if people feel at all uneasy interpersonally, you know, we evolved in small bands that bred mainly internally. Uh, they succeeded when, they, when their members were very cooperative internally and were very aggressive externally. So we have that very strong capability, the two wolves in the heart, as it were, love and hate, to love us and fear, attack, and hate them, right? So what do we do when we've got seven billion people shoved up close cheek by jowl, you know, like in Life of Pi, the guy and the tiger in the lifeboat, seven billion of us in one lifeboat, you know, vulnerable one planet Earth. Um, and so we're very prone to cling tight to us and fear and attack them what to do, right? Well, you can intervene at lots of levels. You know, I'm like a methods guy, I'm a brain guy, so I intervene in terms of the mind and the brain. What can you do? Number one, get out of reactive episodes as fast as you can. Get out of the red zone as quick as you can because your brain is over learning from the red zone. Every red zone episode makes you one smidge, if not 10 smidges, more vulnerable to a reactive, spider flight, stressful, um, you know, fear, uh, frustration, and heartache experience, right? Get out of the red zone as fast as you can. Second, do what you can outside yourself to prevent red zone experiences. You know, do what you can. Uh, think about schedule, think about not adding too many commitments. I should think about that myself. Um, you know, uh, th think about doing what you can to create more safety in your world. You know, we do what we can, all right? Third, and perhaps most important of all, which will be my segue into the practice to do with you momentarily, is to again and again and again help this vulnerable Stone Age brain, which is really older than Stone Age. The nervous system is 600 million years old. You know, each of us has within us a kind of inner lizard, inner mouse, and inner monkey. You know, <laughs> loosely associated with the three layers of the brain. So very loosely, that lizard needs a lot of petting. You're safe, little lizard buddy. <laughs> it's okay. You know, the little mouse needs a lot of cheese. You have enough. It's okay. You're full. There's enough, right? And the monkey needs a lot of hugging. You're okay. 
And especially as what's called neuroplasticity, the capacity of the brain to learn goes down as you move back in time, the inner mouse, but especially the inner lizard, needs a lot of soothing and petting, right? We need a lot of experiences of safety. So the third way to deal with this fundamental issue, this is a design feature in evolution that I've described. The, you know, the three needs, the two fundamental settings of the brain. That's a design feature, but in the 21st century, in many ways, it's a, kind of, it's a kind of design flaw. It's like a bug in the Stone Age brain. So the third thing we can do about it is, again and again and again, help it land inside, 10 seconds at a time, safe, fed, enough, connected, part of, seen, liked, maybe loved, again and again and again. And help this brain take in the good. In other words, again and again and again, roughly 10 seconds at a time. Help it really land, because negative learning lands immediately. The brain fast tracks negative experiences into storage right away. Positive experiences, unless they're highly intense or novel million dollar moments, need to be held in awareness past some loose threshold that's on the order of 5, 10, 20 seconds for them to have a chance of transferring from short-term memory buffers down into long-term storage. So we need to help ourselves really register it when our safety needs are basically met, when our uh, reward-seeking or satisfaction-seeking needs are basically met, and really help it land when our needs for connection are basically met. Not necessarily perfectly, as Jean-Paul Sartre said, hell is other people, okay? <laughs> so, but basically now, okay? And that's an opportunity for us a hundred times over, a thousand times over, 10,000 times over, to drill it into the brain through Mother Nature's well-intended lies. Be afraid, be hungry, be lonely. To drill it into the brain again and again and again that there's no basis for the craving that leads to suffering and harm. There's no biological, psychological, deep basis for the craving that leads to suffering and harm because there's an internalized sense of needs already met, abiding as and engaging life fully and sometimes passionately on the basis of a prior, deeply grounded, unconditional state of fundamental peace, contentment, and love. That's the opportunity for us. A hundred times over, a thousand times over, 10,000 times over. And I don't care who's in charge of the country or whose show is on TV, not one being alive can prevent any one of us from doing this practice. Of registering it in the sanctuary and in the sanctity of our own mind-brain system. So you want to do a little practice of this? Yeah. So I'm going to think of here or introduce two fundamental ways to be loving toward ourselves. One is to help us come home to green again and again and again, knowing that every time we rest in the responsive mode of the brain and actually register it, actually take it in, actually let it come into us, we deepen its neural traces. And it becomes that much harder the next time to knock us out of the green zone when a challenge comes along in life. Because you can engage life on the basis of the responsive mode of the brain. We just need to deepen our keel in the water, as it were, through experiencing again and again of what it feels like to be in the responsive mode with needs basically met. And then, much like a sailboat, as the winds of the world blow with a deeper and deeper keel, it's harder and harder to knock us out of our green zone. It's harder and harder to capsize us. Okay? So one way to love ourselves is to help us help ourselves come home again and again with a felt sense of basic safety, basic satisfaction, basic connection. Also, in particular, to kind of use a bit of a trick from evolution about how to activate qualities of warm-heartedness toward ourselves, which if you think about it, are very unnatural. It's natural to have feral, driven, rah, to do what I need to do to survive. That's natural. But notice what's not present in that. It's not nice. It's not warm to ourselves. We're not saying, oh, sweetie, you've been working really hard. Those nasty people. Kind of, you know. No, it's like, 
<laughs> or, uh, right? So raw survival, that's pretty straightforward. We know how to do that. We also know how to be loving toward others. Because as mammals, especially the most social mammal, social animal on the planet in a profound way, we know how to care for young, we know how to care for our loved ones, we even know how to care for the, the village or tribe it takes to raise a child. All right. But to bring that quality of lovingness, nurturance, sweetness to ourselves, that's not so natural, is it? So a good way to kind of help the brain learn this is to go through a couple of steps that I'll do with you momentarily. Okay, so let's give it a try. So we'll do this kind of quickly. In terms of the first fundamental need for safety, help yourself feel as safe as you can reasonably feel right now. Registering that there are strong walls around you, we're in a protected setting. You can let your breathing slow and calm. Kind of a basic sense of ease, technically parasympathetic nervous system activation, maybe through long exhaling. Maybe finding a sense of strength inside on the basis of which you can afford to feel safe. And then I'll be quiet for about half a minute as you find your, your way into as much as you easily can right now a basic sense of peace with no basis for being at war, no basis for fear. Anxiety fading away, bracing passing away, resting as peace. And letting that sense of peace, whatever has come for you, move to the back of the mind. And turning your attention now to the approaching rewards system of your brain, your natural need for satisfaction. Bringing to mind, for example, some things you feel grateful for or glad about. Or if you just think about them, they make you happy. They make you smile. Opening to some positive emotion, letting yourself have it. Understanding that this is a self-loving act. To let it land that there really is no basis for disappointment right now or frustration. In the periphery of awareness, there may be losses, there may be sadness, but they're held in a larger space of a sense of a fundamental enoughness. So that you can open increasingly into a quality of contentment, basic well-being with no wish for this moment to be anything else than what it is. Here too, I'll be quiet for about half a minute as you open to and let yourself rest in quality of happiness, uh, gladness, well-being, and contentment. And letting whatever qualities of contentment are here, letting them move to the background. And focusing now on the third system, attaching to others, our social needs, needs for connection. Bringing to mind uh, a sense of connection, perhaps to others in this room. Friends and family. Thinking of someone that you know cares about you. and opening to feeling cared about.
cared about is on a kind of range. It includes a sense of belonging or being seen or being appreciated, people who appreciate you or like you or love you. Also being aware of your own warm heart, bringing to mind people that you feel loving toward, compassionate toward, kind toward. The heart opening. If you can, even finding your way, perhaps kind of radically, to a sense of being liked and loved enough. It would be nice to have more, but there's a fundamental kind of sufficiency, liked and loved enough so that there's no basis for clinging. You can relax, resting in love, feeling loved and loving again for the next half minute. And getting a sense of all three together, kind of integrated somehow, a basic sense of peace, basic sense of contentment, basic sense of love, all together a kind of sense of home. Like, wow, this is my home, undisturbed. There's no deficit. There's nothing fundamental lacking. There's no basis for resisting anything or grasping after anything or clinging to anything. There's no real basis for craving. Craving falling away. Abiding home. Letting it sink in. This is what it feels like. Taking in this good. Okay, and then coming back into the room while helping yourself stay home. Even as you engage language or thought more, uh, may get more active or vigorous, while still being rested with all three lights on your dashboard. Blinking or steady green, steady green, all right? Then I want to introduce kind of briefly one last little practice. And actually, I think what I'll do is I'll just name it because I want to open up a little time for talk with each other. A three-step process that works the brain and overcomes or helps overcome this interesting challenge we have about being loving toward ourselves is step one, start with feeling cared about. Help yourself really register it, much as I touched on quite lightly. Really register it that you are loved. Let it sink in. Because research shows that feeling loved primes the attachment systems of the brain so that they're more capable of being loving. All right. Step two, pick one person or more, and it could be different kinds of beings. could be a pet, or animal companion, could be a spiritual being, whatever. It could be a group of people. One or more beings that it's easy for you to feel loving toward. Especially qualities of compassion, moved by suffering, which is a very deep and ancient of uh, mammalian emotion, especially primate human emotion. Moved by compassion, moved toward caring. So now you're warming up your caring circuits, as it were, after having primed them by feeling cared about. And then in the third step, once you have that sense of caring going, and you know what it feels like, you know what it's like in your body, whoop, direct it to yourself. Okay, before you have time to forget what it feels like. 
It's really powerful to start with yourself as a little kid because it's deeply natural to us to care about children as young or as vulnerable or as innocent as you can go. And then see what that's like, including the little child inside each one of us and the deeper layers of the psychic strata, if you will, the, uh, down to bedrock even. And then see if you can also bring that quality of caring for yourself and good wishes for yourself. And you might help to use loving kindness phrases like, may I be happy, or even something quite specific like, may I find work, or may my chemotherapy go well, whatever. You know, you, you have that warmth for yourself um, in that three-step way. Start by feeling cared about. Second, go for something easy to feel caring towards someone. And third, then whoop, apply that to yourself. Okay. So maybe a question or comment, and then we'll wrap up. All right. That was a hand that popped up quickly. Um, one of the earlier speakers of this series, uh, named May, the jolly good fellow from Google, said that he was told by a wise person, a, a master, master, I think, I think that the ground state of consciousness is joy or bliss. Mm. And I wonder if from a neuroscience standpoint, if you have any comments about that. Yeah, okay, so uh, I think you all heard the question or, right, or comments. So I'll be there, that's a huge topic. I'll, I'll be very succinct about it. So first, by consciousness, I think here we're talking about sort of like basic baseline experiencing. Can we use it like that? where there's awareness, but there's an experiencing simultaneous, okay? So I would say absolutely, the resting state, it's really remarkable. What are people like, most people, including us, what are we like when we feel basically safe, basically fulfilled or satisfied, fed, and, there's, and we feel basically cared about? It doesn't even need to be perfect. Boop, we default to our resting state, as our animal ancestors did. I think there's an underlying, um, unease that is continually generative of craving, if you will. That Mother Nature is lying to us. She's deluding us to, for our own good from a survival standpoint. You know, you, you're just a little threatened. You're just a little shorted. You're just a little dismissed, right? So we're always going to be trying. And I think we need, to, especially to take in the good a thousand times over, to help that gradually quiet, that internal whispering of the lie. But I think definitely the resting state uh, is this basic, very rewarded quality of peacefulness, contentment, and love. And what I'm saying is, I just finished a book on this, Hardwiring Happiness. It'll be out in six months. But I, I'm really up on the science of this. And the interesting research is that these resting states are highly rewarded. They feel good because they're good for you. Reactive modes don't feel good. They're not good for us. We're supposed to run from the fire or chase the food, you know, or mate with our partner or whatever, quickly, and then, whew, I need to recover from that. I need a cigarette now there. I need to recover, okay? It doesn't feel that great, you know? Now, interestingly, we can be activated, but as long as there's positive emotion associated with it, we can stay in the green zone. We're passionate in the green zone. We're engaged with life. We're enthusiastic. The root of the word you probably know means God within. You know, and deus, right? Enthusiasm. Uh, we can be engaged fully. We can also be very chill, very tranquil, very peaceful. That's another way to be green, right? But we don't have to tip into negative emotions to get the benefits of sympathetic nervous system activation or being revved up. Uh, we can stay green as we do that. The interesting thing for me is uh, how to imagine, given our vulnerabilities, right? as Stone Age animals with the, you know, the lizard, the rat, and the monkey inside. I like rats, I'm fond of them, but anyway. Um, how do we handle our vulnerabilities, you know, and not tip in to the trouble of the red zone, which we're so vulnerable to overlearning from? That's the art of it. And on, then on the basis of the green zone, and my personal fantasy is a billion brains on green. I think that would be a tipping point in this world today. And because we, we have a world that's on red, we're definitely, way too red, you know, aiming fast for the edge of the cliff with the red, with the red lights blinking and like, you know, greed uh, and fear and, uh, you know, various issues of us and them just driving the bus. Okay, one more person. I'm just interested in, in sort of your, your final conclusion about whether the research about the brain supports or is in conflict with the basic dharma, you know, the Four Noble Truths. It sounds like 
you, you believe that they're consistent, but the idea of ending craving, it sounds like our hard wiring isn't really set up for that. So is, is there ultimately some tension between yeah. how the brain works and the basic dharma? Yeah, so to, to generalize your point, um, if you think about it, the poignant truth is that our brain, the fundamental, the most important organ in the body, the brain being three pounds of tofu-like tissue, you know, inside the coconut, that, that structure, sometimes called the enchanted loom, is the final common pathway of all the causes streaming through us to make this moment of conscious experience, for better or worse, right? It's quite an extraordinary organ. That brain evolved to crave and suffer in order to survive. It also evolved a capacity to default to the resting state, the home base, if you will, of the green responsive mode when we experience that our core needs are met. Because often people can have plenty of walls and guns, they can have plenty of money and food in the larder, and they can have plenty of love, and they still are caught up in the red zone. They're still caught up in, in um, craving of various kinds. All right? So for me, the, the, way, the picture is kind of nuanced. You know? On the one hand, our resting state, when we experience needs are met, um, we go to a place where there's, no, there's very little basis for craving. There's an ongoing resting state whispering to us, low-grade craving that's very interesting to practice with. And I think there's an inherent suffering built into the fundamental contradiction between the fact that um, for us to function in life, we need to essentialize perceptions. We need to have, that's a sound, that's a sight, that's a banana, that's a friend, that's a foe. So that's an entity. But the ongoing streaming of the underlying neural processing in which coalitions of synapses form very briefly to represent a sight, a sound, a taste, a smell of, you know, the hedonic tone, the Vedana, the feeling tones, all the aggregates, all that, right? Even as those coalitions of neurons hook up to form that sound or that desire or that plan or that thought, they're decaying underneath our feet even as we try to hold on to the, and stabilize the percept or the thought that they created, which creates a fundamental tension inside us. That's why practices that help us become increasingly at ease with falling apart, you know, um, actually are, are very powerful ways to undo that kind of hardwired engine of, of tension and uh, reaching continually for the essentialized, stabilized something even as it decays underneath our feet. But I think it's completely possible, on the other hand, to make ourselves accident-prone to grace. In other words, to 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times over, in the 10 seconds at a time, in the days of our lives, tip into enjoyable, rewarding experiences of feeling basically safe, basically satisfied, basically connected, experiences of fundamental peace, contentment, and love that are enjoyable experiences tip into them and gradually teach the brain in a macro sense that there's no basis for craving at that level. Your needs are fundamentally met. And then even go a step further and help drill it in again and again and again to this well-intended delusion that we ought to be anxious and you know, looking for something to want and fundamentally and easy relationally. And then on the basis of that, which feels more and more stabilized, is profound mental health, right? and we're still engaged in life, on the basis of that, have the growing courage and capacity to completely fall apart and realize that in the very broadest sense, um, you as allness, as James said, quoting Dogen, intimate with all things, keep going on being. And that's a beautiful way to live, to function, and to bring our whole planet as a whole home to green. So, thanks. <laughs>